killing our children. Put your guns down. Rochester tonight dealing with deadly violence, the likes of which it has not seen before. We as a community need to stand up and, and you know, we need to put our foot down and, and say enough is enough. Lives lost, families devastated, communities plagued. Gun violence and violence in our community is a cycle. Rochester now in its most violent year on record. Tonight, a 13 Wham special report, a city in crisis. And Rochester remains in a state of emergency tonight. Good evening, I'm Jenny Ryan. And I'm Doug Ambridge. 13 Wham tonight taking a closer look at the pursuit of suspected criminals and how our city is trying to take back its streets. 75 lives have been lost to violence this year alone. A record number of homicides. Fewer than half of those cases have been solved. It's a level of deadly crime that has not been seen in three decades. And scenes like this happening so frequently. Among the most recent cases, four teenagers were shot. A father accused of killing his own son. And along with the search for suspects, the search tonight for solutions. We will be joined by Rochester Mayor-elect Malik Evans. He will share his plan on combating crime. We begin tonight with 13 WHAMS, Jane Flash, and the vigilant police work underway. There have been a record 75 homicides so far this year. The U.S. Marshal and top members of law enforcement tell me this has required them to think differently. The sheriff's SWAT team surrounds a home in East Rochester. Inside, one of two twin brothers. Both are suspected of brutally beating, stabbing, and shooting a man in the middle of the afternoon outside of the busy transit center on St. Paul. People that we arrested this morning with the sheriff's SWAT team incredibly violent people that just did a brazen violent crime in the middle of the daytime and we grabbed them already because we'll we're coming after you since april the u.s marshal service in rochester has shifted its main focus that has been our main focus since probably about april and may of this year rpd identifies the suspect in cases the marshal's fugitive task force tracks them down since summer cases involving 40 suspects have been turned over 38 have been apprehended. Our main focus with our state and local partners is to go after the most violent offenders, the shooters, the homicide suspects, sexual assault suspects. In this task force effort, there are partners who sat down with me today. U.S. Marshals, Monroe County Sheriffs, RPD, state troopers. Everything that happens in the city ripples out to the towns and to the county. If the city fails, we all fail. The level of violence is the highest I have seen it since I started back in the 90s. Um, it's, you know, honestly, it's discouraging. David Smith was with RPD when homicides hit a record in 1991. Now, as interim chief, the numbers are even higher, 75. He links the violence to another surge. We take at least one illegal gun off the street every day, at least one. And yet the number of guns that are still out there is, is incredible. I've never seen this many before. While the task force targets arrests, another program through New York State puts more officers in areas where the most shots are being fired. On Monday, the SWAT team and marshals successfully arrested Ronald and Donald Brown, who are now charged with second-degree murder. In between those arrests, they tracked down Stephen Owen, who's now charged with killing his 34-year-old son. Every day our guys are out there in the sheriff's office, the state police, and the city on the marshals task force arresting these violent people. And now we're all putting more resources in it to get them off the street, to get more people off the street quicker. The Fugitive Task Force allows RPD to spend less time chasing suspects and more time solving crimes. 43 homicides, about 60%, currently remain unsolved. Jane Flash, 13 WAM News. We want to talk tonight about the shattering impact of this violence. Lives forever altered. Tonight, a Rochester mother sharing her grief. It was here on Treadman Street, October 2nd last year, that 18-year-old Lyshawn Curry was shot to death. Lyshawn was a recent graduate of Northeast Prep, and the act of violence that took his life has forever changed his family. Lyshawn was an amazing kid. He loved sports. He was an artistic person. 
Cheer was his, his, his thing. He loved cheer. When you lose a child to violence like you did, and you have four other children, how does that impact how you try to protect them? Um, you become a little bit stronger than what you were before, uh, a little over more protective. But sometimes it's hard because we don't want our kids to feel like we're hindering them. We want them to live, but at the same time, you're scared for them to live. This world is a little different than what we could have imagined. In the year since you've lost LaShawn, how many other young lives that are you, you're aware of have been lost? From the time that we've had the one year anniversary on October 1st, 18. Um, since then, adding on, it's probably been going on 22 to 23 children alone. These are all people that you know. Mm -hmm. Young people that have been lost to violence. How do you process that? It's hard. I sit in my room and every time you get on social media, you see rest in peace to a young child and you cry because it brings you back to that moment that you lost your own child. Um, that phone call is the most petrifying phone call a mother could receive. The next time we have to see our child is when we're saying goodbye. And that is a painful, that's painful, that's painful. I didn't get to see my child to the day before his funeral and it's hurtful. What do you personally think could help solve this? Um, personally, more talks, more, more motivation, giving these kids something better to do than being in the streets. Um, it's harder for them to get a job or it's hard for them to find something that they, that's motivating them. We have to be a motivation to these children. Got a new mayor taking office in January. What would be your message to him as a mother? Give us more support as mothers. It's a lot of single mothers out here, and we do the best that we can. A lot of us are working multiple jobs, going to school, taking care of our kids, and it's hard because we can't be in every place at once. We need that support. We need something for our kids to have to lean on when they can't lean on us because we're not there all the time. Tatiana Boger is now preparing for the trial of the man charged with killing her son. She also hopes to form a group, Mothers with Children Against Violence. Tatiana, that mother, had a message from Mayor-elect Malik Evans, and he is joining us now. Thank you so much for being here, Mayor-elect. We just heard from Tatiana Boger, who lost her son, Lyshawn, to violence. She said mothers in Rochester need help. What can you say to her tonight? I can say that she's absolutely right. You know, I got chills when she said that because for so many parents, um, particularly in Rochester, where we have a high level of um, single parents, they're working two and three jobs. And that is why one of the centerpieces of our plan that we talked about was our youth opportunity agenda because we believe um, that if we are able to give young people more, better opportunities, more uh, access to job opportunities, that they will be so busy working that they will not want to look um, to the streets. And that means um, jobs, recreational opportunities, youth development opportunities. How do we increase those things to make sure that long term young people feel as though they have a place where they can go um, to get support and, and, and turn away from violence? Um, so I think that that's important. But how do we also um, support uh, mothers who may want to um, get more job training or be able to have the opportunity to work one job so that way they can spend more time um, with their children uh, in, in helping them? When you're working two jobs, um, that is extremely uh, difficult to do. So I, 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 I um, am, am touched by what um, the mother said, um, what Ms. Bogart said, and it's something that I will um, definitely um, have in the back of my mind as we work to craft policies that will help um, stump out violence in our community. You were just speaking a few hours ago in a press conference about your plan to take on violence this afternoon. Um, we know there are many solutions. There's not a single one. But she talked about motivation. Motivation kind of equals hope. Is there a particular uh, uh, solution that you see that perhaps gives you more hope than any other? I, I think one of the solutions that I think is key is the holistic approach by us working with the county and all of our partners. 
Um, so we have to we have to address this um, in two ways, and it's just not one solution. And I always tell people if it was just one thing, we would have figured it out a long time ago. So that involves making sure that we um, not just focus on, on, on one thing, but we look at multiple things. First off, we have to stop the bleeding. So let's be real. Um, the violence that we're seeing in our street is absolutely unacceptable. That's why I convened the meeting today with every single level of law enforcement, um, from the U.S. attorney to um, the Rochester Police Department. How can they work to um, target folks who are creating most of the crime. So we need to take a scalpel approach and not a sledgehammer. The vast majority of Rochester residents are doing the right thing and they are good people. The people who are wreaking havoc, carrying guns and deciding to kill people, there's a small amount of those individuals. And we pretty much know who they are. We need to get them off the streets and we need to remove them from society so they can stop inflicting this harm. But then there's the long-term solution, and that is making sure that young people don't have um, a path to violence in the first place. So that's job training. That's uh, mediation. That's alternatives to the streets. And um, that's making sure that we beef up anti-violence, anti-violence um, anti programs, that we are intervening in situations before they happen, and that we are providing that motivation for young people to see that life um, is important, that life is precious, and that they have the ability to soar and do well um, and, if they don't, and if they don't go that route, they will end up either in the cemetery or in prison. So mm -hmm. how do we send that message to young people to make sure that as they grow, they will not grow into a life of violence? So it, it, this, this concept of getting in front of young people is absolutely critical because we're seeing the highest numbers ever of young people either perpetrating gun violence or being affected by gun violence. Members of law enforcement have been very critical about recent bail reform passed in Albany. In fact, they blame a lot of the recent upsurge in crime on bail reform. What role would you say that plays in what we're seeing in Rochester? I think that we have to live, follow the data. I mean, there are some cities in, Ro in New York State that actually have seen a decrease in homicides. Rochester has seen an increase. And we talked about this today with our um, partners in law enforcement. And one of the things that I committed to was trying to see what the data was telling us. What's happening in Syracuse? What's happening in Buffalo, Albany, New York City, and other places? Um, are they having the same things, uh, seeing the same spikes that Rochester is seeing? If not, why? And why are Rochester seeing, seeing those things? So I always um, say that you have to lead with the data. And if there are things that are taking place that need to be recalibrated, we should advocate from a policy le level um, to recalibrate. But I think that it's important that we look at the data um, whenever we talk about bail reform or any of the other things um, that might be leading to individuals, um, violent individuals having a gun and then getting out. Let me be clear. If someone um, is accused of shooting someone and then they are found with an illegal gun, um, we need to make sure that they are not going to be in a position to be able to inflict more harm on this community. That is what people are demanding, and that is what we have to make sure that we put a stop to. Sometimes I know we look to other places to, to see where there might be solutions, see what's working elsewhere. And you were telling us a few minutes ago that we might find some answers in Newark, New Jersey. Yeah, you know, I mean, Newark, um, they, they, you know, they've been under a, um, a, uh, a, a um, federal decree, but they have seen um, a, a lot of success in terms of tackling crime, engaging the community from a community-based perspective, um, uh, creating good relationships between um, law enforcement and, uh, and, and their citizens are there. They have a long way to go, um, but their mayor has been at the forefront in terms of creating an environment where um, police and citizens have been able to work, to work together to address some of the most um, violent crime in that city. So Newark um, is um, a great city to look to. It's a little bigger than Rochester, but uh, I think that they also face a lot of the challenges um, that we face in our city. And it's important for us to understand, as the book Ecclesiastic says, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. So instead of us looking for things that are new, we can look to other cities that are dealing with um, similar situations and try to use those tools to address our violence that we have here in Rochester. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You said you might be visiting Newark to see it firsthand? That's right. I will be visiting Newark to see it firsthand. All right. 45 days until mm -hmm. you take office. We are grateful that you spent some time with us tonight to talk about this very important issue. I know the conversation is just starting for you as mayor of Rochester, and we'll be following that. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having us. And enjoy your holidays. <laughs> All right. It's not just police who are trying to make changes here. Also activists and leaders in the faith community. The spirit of fear should not be allowed to fester in our community. Activists and pastors gathered this week to announce their Power of Prayer mission. At least 30 local churches are going to take turns hosting prayer rallies outside of the church walls. They hope to connect people to support and to get more people back to church.
We are committing as a holistic church across uh, denominations, across cultures, uh, and across ethnicities uh, to begin uh, to do uh, uh, what we are able to do, which is to pray and to guide and direct the people to uh, programs that will be helpful. While our city's homicide rate is historic, this crime trend in Rochester isn't new. It has ebbed and flowed over the past several decades. Dan Schrack spoke with a former city leader who says the only way to solve the issue is to do what has worked in the past. Flashing lights and crime scene tape have become a common sight in Rochester. The city hitting a record high for homicides this year. I've seen this happen in waves. Former Rochester Mayor Bill Johnson says the best way to address the issue quickly is to trust what has proven beneficial in the past. An approach of interdiction, prevention, and a collective conversation. We implemented programs, we reallocated resources, we opened up our recreation centers. We went after these young people who were causing problems. We created jobs, we created training programs. I'm telling you, Diane, I know it works. At its peak in the early 90s, the homicide rate hit 69. During that time, Wayman Daniels got involved in gang activity. So what happens is when you're psychologically conditioned for this lifestyle, you live in the jungle, you become the jungle. If all you see is violence and everyone is negative and violent, you become that. Daniels says it was that violent, negative behavior that landed him in prison for the better part of a decade. Knowing he never wanted to go back, when Daniels was released, he decided to turn his life around. You can make a change. I've been he now shares his story to help it. others. And we can't be independent in a community because when you break it down, it's community. Let's be unified. Johnson says that unification between community groups, law enforcement, city leaders, and everyday citizens can change lives for the better. And there are a lot of young people now who are out here at leading productive lives, who are now adults, who will tell you that if it hadn't been for the intervention that they got to turn them around, they would have been on the pathway to prison or to death. Dan Schrack, 13 Wham News. Both Johnson and Daniels agree the efforts underway are good, but they say they need to work as one, with the people of Rochester uh, making a sizable change. A central issue amid the violence spike is bail reform. You heard the mayor-elect talking about it. Police say New York sweeping bail reform law opened the floodgates for repeat offenders. However, advocates say bail reform was and is much needed. Advocates will also say that raise the age is needed. It is a controversial issue, though, many supporting it. Others say it only contributes to more crime. Since 2019, the state has made some key changes in how it handles 16 and 17 year olds charged with a crime. Here again is Jane Flash. On the sidewalk outside the Lyle Avenue apartment is a coat belonging to a mail carrier who used it to try to smother the flames from the clothes and body of Stephen Amenhauser. Rochester police say 16-year-old Xavion Perry and 14-year-old Adrell Riley doused the victim in a flammable liquid, then lit him on fire. The 14-year-old has a record in family court. In September, he was charged with robbing a victim at Knife Point in Gates and a second robbery a month later in the city. Then in January, both of those teens were caught together in a stolen car. The police can't be the parents for these kids. Prior to the rollout of Raise the Age, anyone who was 16 years old and charged with a crime uh, would essentially be treated in a way that was similar to how an adult was treated. Uh, they would go in front of a criminal court. Uh, they would face uh, a similar sentence. Attorney Dan Strollo is a former prosecutor who handled youth prosecutions during the transition to Raise the Age, which utilizes a new court with a new set of rules. 16 and 17 year old offenders are diverted into youth part, which is a it's kind of a hybrid court. It is a criminal court. It is presided over by a family court judge. When they arraign a, uh, a youth part defendant, they have to presume that they're going to release them unless there's some compelling reason not to do that. There are many cases where probation diversion is able to get them back on the right path, and we hope that we don't see them in the justice system again. One of the problems, though, is the way that these records become sealed makes it very, very difficult to track a recidivism rate. Um, 
you know, any time a case is removed out of youth part into family court, the, ca the criminal records are sealed. You could have one offender that is standing in front of a youth part judge who recognizes them, knows them by name the moment they see them, but we have to engage in this fiction and say, well, they don't have a criminal history. What has been the result of that? To be quite honest with you, I think that there is a lack of association now between committing a crime and having an actual tangible consequence, and I think that we're seeing that bear out through the horrible violence that our city is facing right now. There's a lot of murder offenses that have been committed by people under the age of 18. We've seen an uptick in that. Um, I don't know how many are pending right now in the youth part, but it's a substantial number. I think that the raise the age legislation definitely contributed to more crime. I hate to say it. There was, I would hope that the legislature goes back to the drawing table and comes up with a better way to handle these cases because this isn't working. Jane Flash, 13 WAM News. It has been two years since the Raise the Age legislation was fully enacted here in New York. Now, we want to point out there are proponents who say this law has been beneficial when it comes to dealing with minor offenses and rehabilitating young offenders. Two sides, of course, to every story. Nearly a year ago, the city of Rochester launched its Crisis Intervention Services Office. The goal is to create a comprehensive, community-based response to support victims and families who are dealing with homicides. The unit includes a homicide response team. Team members respond to every scene. The focus is on connecting the family of the victim with help they need. Services range from help with burials to grief counseling. Aaliyah Henton-Williams oversees the office. She believes it can help curb potentially violent crime while assisting those in need. She says this has been a tragic year. The numbers were very high in the 90s. Um, but this year has been particularly heartbreaking. It is, it is an exhausting time for everyone in the community. We are drained, we are hurting, and to see the families experience these things in, in the first few hours of having to accept the news that a loved one has been killed is something that is traumatic even for the team as responders. And so um, we are struggling and it has taken their prayers and the support of many to be able to continue to do this work. Several members of the homicide response team have experienced homicides on a personal level. We have someone on the team who has lost a son to a homicide. I myself lost a brother in 1992 and a sister in 2018. And so I've been affected personally. And those experiences connect us immediately to these victims and those are the motivation and driving forces behind the work that we do. We have posted a link to Rochester's Office of Crisis Intervention Services on 13wham.com. We say this a lot and we've been doing this for years and we remind you about the work of Crime Stoppers. If you have information about any crime that might help police, you can call the Crime Stoppers hotline. It's 423-9300. They pay cash rewards. You're given a code number. You don't ever have to give your name and uh, you can remain anonymous through the process. We thank you for watching our special report tonight. Our coverage is going to continue at 10 and 11 on 13wham.com. And we want to leave you with the names of the 75 homicide victims lost in Rochester this year. As we say, good night. Thank you.